So I very much uh, appreciate the kind invitation to join you all and um, want to also congratulate the program on this new cyber intelligence initiative. And so to set the stage for this, um, the organizers asked me to essentially go through some of the larger topics that will be the context of not just cybersecurity, but security writ large in the years ahead. And you can see by this depiction, it sort of captures the challenge, uh, not just for a speaker trying to do that, but anyone working in the intelligence craft, if you're trying to peer into the future. Um, now, as you might not have uh, noticed, we're in silly season, we're in election season right now. So one way to frame this is what will be the issues on the plate for the next presidency. And you can cut out them in lots of different ways, whether it's, um, I think, conflicts that we are likely to be drawn deeper into, regardless of who wins, like Syria, to failed states that uh, are on the brink right now, be it South Sudan or Venezuela, to um, brittle states that could fail, including um, whether it's a North Korea to some, maybe not on our radar screen, like a Saudi Arabia. Um, or it can be bigger trends, issues like climate change or urbanization that I think are going to be moving more to the fore as issues in politics and for both corporate uh, actors and um, intelligence community actors. But I thought I'd um, focus on three larger trends, larger issues that fascinate me, but I think they will be an issue not just for the next president, and the intelligence world over the next four years, but the next four presidencies. That is, sort of think about these as generational level concerns. And of course, they apply not just to a president and the formal intelligence community, but to the world beyond. And essentially, there are three. They're technology, a place, and a race. Now, the first is the technology, but don't just think of this as an individual technology, but rather technologic change overall. And it goes by a series of different names, buzzwords that are out there, you know, be it game-changing technologies, disruptive technologies, revolutionary technologies that are killer apps. Basically what we're talking about is the emergence of a series of capabilities that were only imagined in science fiction a generation ago that cause us to reconsider not just what's possible, but also what's proper, issues of right and wrong. And you can frame that issue of right and wrong in everything from ethical issues of right and wrong to right, the right and wrong way to organize my business unit, the right and wrong way to recruit someone who might be operating in my government agency. Now, I was part, you know, what are these technologies? And I was part of a uh, research project called Next Tech. And we basically uh, interviewed roughly 60 scientists from organizations that range like DARPA to IARPA to um, leading experts in the corporate world from companies like Google and Facebook to venture capitalists, the people that are putting their money in making the future come true. And we asked them a very basic question. What do you think today is a technology that's equivalent to the computer in 1980. So it's not science fiction, but it really hasn't yet changed the world. What's the equivalent of that? And they, this is a word cloud of some of the things that they told us. But basically they broke down into five key buckets, five key technologic shift areas. The first, and, and as I'm going through these, I want to pull back and don't just think about these as classic security technologies, but you know, one of the signs of a game-changing technology is how it moves back and forth between the commercial world and the defense world. So the first bucket is hardware and specifically robotics. And not just the robotics that we're using today, whether it's in a factory line to um, a drone that's used for strike uh, over Pakistan, which has of course changed the operations of an intelligence agency as it's become you know, basically uh, you know, a killing machine. But what comes next when it comes to these technologies? And basically it's more, 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 more. These technologies are becoming more diverse in their size, shape, form. They're becoming more autonomous and more capable, 
which means they can do more things on their own, but also take on more roles. So they start out being for ISR, for surveillance, whether it's a drone uh, surveilling over Pakistan or a drone that's being used by a paparazzi to track a, um, a star, to moving into other roles, like I mentioned, strike. Uh, CIA has conducted more than 500 airstrikes into Pakistan. Uh, to delivery of different kinds of uh, things as opposed to Hellfire missiles delivery, the delivery of everything from packages, which is what, of course, Amazon is planning, to um, humanitarian aid. We've already seen in Rwanda drones be used to deliver uh, blood samples between clinics and places in austere locations. Um, that also means, as the Rwanda example illustrates, operating from more locations. So flying off of everything from aircraft carriers, as we've seen in testing, to the hands of a teenager, being whether that teenager is a soldier, an intelligence analyst, or just a kid, um, to being, therefore, more proliferated in more groups' hands whether they are the over um, 80 different nations right now that are flying drones within their military and intelligence community to corporate actors that range from corporate security actors, like, for example, private military companies, to corporate actors, as I mentioned, using them for you know, delivery, surveillance, you name it. Um, now, that's hardware. Next bucket, software. And you can package this in lots of different ways, from the um, ubiquitous sensors that surround us. Uh, we have roughly 50 billion sensors in the world today. Uh, and um, they're collecting information on everything from uh, ones where it's deliberately collecting information, be it a camera on a drone, to a camera in your iPhone, to collecting information in the background. So whether it's the geolocation inside your iPhone to, uh, as was mentioned earlier, collecting information seemingly on the temperature in a room, but then you can utilize that to collect information of a different kind in audio. Now when you've got this massive amount of collection of information, you're getting more and more data in manners we've never seen before, big data, and don't just think of big data as massive amounts, it's analytics that allow you to draw exciting new conclusions, surprising conclusions from that big data that's out there. And then one of the key ways of doing that is a third shift in software, which is basically, we heard a little bit from the last speaker, artificial intelligence, where you are using algorithms to get inside an inhuman, observe, orient, decide, act, an OODA loop. And we're particularly seeing this in cybersecurity in lots of different ways. Um, so for example, it might be using AI and detection, given the massive amounts that are coming at you, to, as the last speaker put it, we're using it in threat prioritization. Don't just detect it, tell me which is the most important thing, to given the speed of everything in this space, frankly, we're turning to the machines to make the automated response to it, rather than waiting for the human to play. And so, you know, Watson there, um, isn't just uh, competing in jeopardy, Watson is already competing for cybersecurity contracts. The third bucket is in what you might describe as wave wear. It's basically energy. Energy in new sources, and particularly think about this as the um, distributed power grid and using renewables and the like, and so I'll get to later on, think about the cybersecurity implications of that, um, but also new uses of energy in terms of the weapons themselves, where in all of human history, we always use some kind of kinetic force, a fist, a bomb, a bullet, we're now seeing things that were once science fiction lasers being deployed, uh, for example, out on U.S. Navy warships. Um, fourth category, not the uh, where, W-A-R-E, but the where in terms of the location. Basically think of this as um, 3D printing, direct digital manufacturing, additive manufacturing, whatever um, description you want to put over it. It's the idea of taking a bit a computer design and turning it into an atom, a thing. 3D printing is doing to the overall marketplace, but particularly the security marketplace, what the iPod did to the music industry disrupting everything from um, the delivery mechanisms to creating huge new debates over intellectual property. Who owns it? 
um, or the military parallel would be uh, what Samuel Colt did to the defense industry with his interchangeable parts. Changing um, not merely what you make, but more importantly, disrupting things like the uh, prototype and development time to, as I mentioned, IP questions, but a bigger level, basically changing who makes things and where they make things. And so we're seeing that shift in everything from the insourcing of manufacturing back to the United States to government agencies now making their own spare parts for equipment that defense contractors plan to sell for them for over 50 years. And not just making their own spare parts, but making them in locations that range from forward operating bases in Afghanistan to I see our Navy officers there nodding their head because we have seen Navy officers make drones, 3D printed drones, on warships. So you're making the drone on a warship and flying it off of the warship. Next category wet wear, human performance modification. We're using both chemicals but also hardware, to go back to the prior point, to reshape what is possible. And again, don't just think about this as the individual, you know, some kind of super soldier or what it does to the individual analyst. So, you know, to give an example, uh, you know, people want to think about as like sort of, you know, huge, you know, getting muscular like. It's actually more important maybe in things like, for example, um, your thinking processes. Uh, we know that essentially you hit, uh, you're in sort of thinking um, in the course of an hour, you're at peak performance only about six minutes out of that hour. And people take a lot of different ways of getting in the zone, you know, so they may concentrate, they may drink coffee, uh, whatever it is. Now imagine doing your job where you could stay in that zone, that intellectual zone, not six minutes, but 12 minutes. You'd be twi twice as productive. Or imagine, for example, um, if you, instead of requiring seven hours of sleep require just three hours of sleep but could operate at the same performance level. These are not imaginary things. This is already possible. But again, don't just think about that as the individual. Think about what it means for organizations. Training time. If it used to take us 12 months to train someone up to be an analyst to do a certain job, what if now we can, it'll take us just six months or three months? What does that mean for our generation uh, in terms of building organizations? Or if the performance of each individual changes, what does it mean for the number of people that you need in an organization? These are the kind of shifts that come out of this. Or just cool things like that guy there on the corner who is controlling a drone uh, it, well, in this case, he's controlling a robotic hand, but there's also ones that control a drone through thought alone. Now, all of these are amazing, but to circle back to the theme of the event, each and every one of them come with enormous cybersecurity consequences. So, writ large, um, the Internet of Things, these are all different things, uh, HP did a study and found that 70% of the things currently being woven into the overall Internet of Things already have significant vulnerabilities to them. And I think there's something bigger, though, to worry about here than just the raw numbers, and 70% is a pretty scary one. It's the idea that with things, you can cause real consequences, and that will not only drive up customer um, interest and demand in cybersecurity, but it's also going to drive more regulatory um, demand and requirements, is because we're going to see more and more hacks that both matter, but government and Congress in particular can wrap its head around the consequences of them. So whether it's something like car hacks, that again, we've already seen, to medical device hacks. These are all examples of things that have been embedded in the human body, but we've seen vo cybersecurity vulnerabilities for them. To um, drone hacks. Uh, so, for example, at the recent um, cybersecurity convention um, at RSA, uh, someone showed off how you could hack uh, the most popular police drone in the world. Now, the, that's all the different technologies, but as it ended there, it leads to a new challenge. 
the place, the domains. And the way to think about this is that the cause and course of um, future threats and conflicts is unpredictable, but I think there's some things we can be confident about. One is the idea that we'll be fighting in new locations. Some of these will be locations that we fought in before but haven't for a while. So, for example, um, the U.S. military has not fought a peer in the air since it was the Army Air Corps for 70 years. The U.S. Navy's not fought a peer at sea for over 70 years. If we were to see a conflict, uh, say, um, in the Pacific, it would definitely involve a uh, battle at sea in the air to, guess what, in Iraq right now, every single actor, including ISIS, is already flying drones, so we now have air defense questions that the uh, military hasn't had to wrestle with for a long time. But again, to link back to sort of the bigger themes here is that we'll be fighting in places we've never fought before. So it's not just a relearning an old lesson, it's really something new. And it's the idea of fights in cyberspace. Now, what are the modes, though, of cyber conflict? And I show you this because I, I think cyber war is a term that is um, abused and misused as much as the word war itself. Um, so what are the modes of what I would call cyber conflict? And what, therefore, will you be seeking to gather intelligence about in order to try and prevent? And again, this is now, just think about this in the space of military or U.S. government intelligence community, but every one of these will play out for commercial civilian actors just simply by the very nature that um, this is a space that is, that is civilian. The Internet is civilian. It's run by civilian companies. Um, to Even if you're going after the U.S. military, 98% of the U.S. military communications go over the civilian-owned and operated Internet. But basically, it breaks into a couple key, uh, I would argue, five modes of cyber conflict, many of which we're already seeing right now. The first is the collection of open source information. Go back to that discussion that I had of um, all the different sensors that are out there that are gathering information. But we also have a shift in the internet to what they call Web 2.0, but it's basically the emergence of social media, where we are all now distributors of that information. So we're seeing this related to conflict in all sorts of uh, ways. Essentially, um, every single armed group conflict actor today, be it ISIS to Chicago gangs, are online distributing information, telling their story through social media, but also beyond them, every single incident of conflict is being captured and talked about online either by the direct combatants or the people that are witnessing it. And so we're seeing it in everything from cyber conflict where you want to know what Anonymous is going to do next? Go to the Anonymous Twitter feed to ISIS is running its own Instagram um, of everything from its operations to the uh, lovable Cats of Jihad feed um, to Facebook has helped reveal what were supposed to be covert deployments of U.S. Special Forces to Syria. But in turn, as everything from Russian um, operations in Ukraine to the U.S. presidential campaign, we're also seeing a reaction to this where all of this information is out there, but we see efforts to bury it in a sea of lies and misinformation. And there are many parallels and even connections between activities on Russian info war side and presidential campaign discussion side to keep your eye on. But the point and the overall issue here is that arguably there are no more secrets, but the truth is harder to find. 
The second type of conflict mode is the classic theft of information, be it stealing battle plans to personnel information to create profiles. So many of uh, you in the room have likely received this lovely letter from the OPM letting them you know that uh, your clearance was taken by, um, information about you was taken by someone. Um, now, the commercial version of this sort of theft of information deploying it, we're seeing again in lots of different ways. One is just in sort of the classic story of crime. So I was recently doing a project with the maritime industry, and we've seen interesting examples of, uh, for example, um, a incident where a freighter was hijacked at sea and the crew retreats to the citadel because this is a typical thing that happens and then it's you know, taken to Somalia and sold for ransom. And that's not what played out. The hijackers go down inside where all the different pallets are held. They find a specific pallet by the barcode, crack that open, steal what's inside, turned out to be a couple hundred million in diamonds, and leave. What played out was, and the, the, you know, the shipping company's like, well, how did they know where that one specific pallet was? because of the cybersecurity side of this discussion. So we're seeing cross of classic crime and cybersecurity crime. Um, don't just think about this as thieving you know, uh, credit cards. But related to this, and maybe you know, the most challenging, is the cross of these modes of the criminal side with the government espionage side and how it's playing out in particular in intellectual property theft where the victims of it range from energy companies to soft drink companies to defense contractors and there's different ways of uh, valuing the, the loss of this one is just by the sheer economic value that's been stolen um, this, there's lots of different ways to estimate it but is in terms of the economic security harm to the United States it measures at least in the several hundred billion dollars worth of economic value taken. Some would argue even as much as a trillion dollar in economic value. But the bottom, if you summed it together, it would be the largest theft in all of human history. But it also has direct security consequences. So to illustrate that, um, you know, these two fighter jets, it's the picture of the same one, right? The top one's gray, bottom one's black. Actually, the top one is the F-35, the most expensive weapons project in all of human history, more than the Manhattan Project. And the idea behind it was the F-35 was going to give the US and all of our allies a generation ahead advantage against our potential foes. And it would also, we could sell it to lots of other people and make money off of it. The bottom one is the J-31, which either just coincidentally looks like the F-35 or it's the fact that, um, at least in uh, our Ghost Fleet book, we were able to docu document that the F-35 program had been hacked on at least three separate occasions. This has consequence, not just in the export market, but maybe a future conflict. The next type, though, is to not steal information, but to block the flow of information, whether it's companies being hit with a DDoS, to a, a sort of an individual firm level, to what happened to essentially the nation of Ukraine as a whole during its recent war with Russia. Arguably, Ukraine lost the cyber conflict before the actual war ever began because Russia owned both figuratively and literally its communications networks. And so it was able to go after the communication such that it was essentially able to isolate, in particular, not just think about this as uh, Ukrainian government agencies, but individual Ukrainian military units lost the communication going both from their bosses, and in turn, when they're asking their bosses, what should we do, they're not hearing anything, and that was one of the keys to the quick Russian moves. They also went after, you know, of course, things like banks to, uh, more recently, the discussion over uh, power companies. Next type is not stealing, not blocking, but changing information. 
And the examples here range from um, doing it in cohesion with old school military operations. So uh, Operation Orchard, where Israel conducts a sort of simultaneous, through electronic warfare and cyber means, they, in essence, shut down Syrian air defenses and then they fly over them with F-15s, which drop bombs. So it's sort of the cyber and the classic military working hand in hand. To our effort, I can talk about it, some of these people in the room can't, which is basically Stuxnet. Um, Stuxnet was a wonderful little device uh, that was used to sabotage Iranian nuclear research. It didn't steal the information, it didn't block the information, it changed the information. Um, and in so doing, caused their machinery to do things like spin out of control, changing the pressure links, um, damaging itself. Basically, it was very effective. Um, it set back Iranian nuclear research. Uh, it's a win. It's notable, though, in a number of key ways. One is that it's arguably the very first cyber weapon. It was not a thing, it's software, and yet it caused damage to things. That's what weapons do. But go back to the second issue is, um, go back to the issue, uh, the idea of what's changing with drones and AI. It was arguably the first autonomous weapon. It wasn't steered into the target. It was given a target and set free to hit it. And it was even given a self-destruct. It wasn't supposed to report back. No human controlled it. If it had been a thing, we would have described that as an autonomous weapon. And so I would argue it was. The next issue, though, is that um, it went after not a military target in the classic sense of the term, but industrial control systems, which actors that range from power companies to um, the engine rooms of be it a cruise ship to a warship all depend on. Finally, um, it could be uh, argued it was the first ethical weapon and that it had a single target to hit and it only damaged that target, which we've never seen possible before. But, final lesson from this, the very fact that I can talk about it shows how things don't always work out as planned. It definitely sabotaged the um, Iranian nuclear research, but it also popped up in at least 25,000 other computers in the world, which is what caught security researchers' eyes and led them to talk about it and led it to be revealed. The point is that just like what happened in all these other domains when we began to enter them, whether it was you know, going into the air or under the sea, we have all sorts of issues to figure out. You know, what's the best way to organize? Who should we re recruit to do these jobs? To bigger issues like what's the ethical way to use a cyber weapon? To a larger meta-level question is when do I know I'm at cyber war? When does it end? Those kind of discussions. And that leads to the third big issue, which is the race. So we heard about technology changes, we heard about the place, the next is the race. Um, one of the, the projects I'm involved in is uh, a, a popular science called Eastern Arsenal. And essentially we're using one of those things I mentioned, open source methodology to track China's military and technology rise. And so we've been able to document everything from, you know, it's not just China is stealing intellectual property, it's doing a lot of cool cutting edge work on its own. Uh, the world's fastest supercomputer is in China, to um, three different long range drone strike programs, to um, that little uh, armed robot uh, design. One, just like in the US for the people doing threat intelligence, one of the best ways to figure out what's being worked on is monitor what's happening on universities and then when it goes dark that's a sign of not failure but success um, so we've seen certain things like that but the bigger issue here is not just the technology, it's the reemergence of China onto the international stage. As Foreign Affairs uh, Magazine put it, the rise of China will likely be the most important international relations story of the 21st century. But it remains unclear whether that story will have a happy ending. It went on to ask, will an era of US-Chinese tension be as dangerous as the Cold War? Will it be even worse because China unlike the Soviet Union, will prove to be a serious economic competitor as well as a geopolitical competitor. Big challenge. Or could it be even worse than that even worse? What I'm talking about is that cold wars don't inherently stay cold. 
or as a Chinese military officer put it, quote, we must bear a third world war in mind when developing our forces. This is a um, depiction of, uh, from Chinese media of what they think World War III would look like. You can see it's going really bad for whoever operates Nimitz-class uh, aircraft carriers. Um, <laughs> And that's what we wrestle with in the book, Ghost Fleet, is this idea of we believe that there is a return to great power rivalry playing out in the 21st century. You can see those tensions with Russia. You can see the tensions with China. And therefore, we might see 20th century style great power competition, but with 21st century modalities to it, be it in an outright conflict and again, I'm not saying this will happen. I'm just saying something that was thinkable in the 20th century that then, you know, for the last generation was unthinkable. It's thinkable once more. And it's changing lots of different things. But the point is that with it being in the realm of possibility, it puts a challenge on us to try to avoid it through a focus on deterrence and avoiding miscalculation. But to go back to this space, it's difficult when you've got these new domains where we don't well understand how and why deterrence might play out in cyberspace to the risks of miscalculation arguably could be much harder in a new domain like cybersecurity. So final wrinkles to all of this though is not just it's a new race with a new competitor, but who else is in this race? And it's exemplified by the folks in this room. Who's the leader? Who's the follower? So the last time we had a um, kind of competition like this, the American economy was clearly American companies making things. They were the arsenal of democracy. Detroit was the centerpiece of it. To now the economy is globalized. It's multinational. And so not just governments, but companies have to navigate this world where they may, for example, be doing business in two competitive actors. And uh, literally yesterday I talked with um, Vint Cerf, who's basically the guy who created what we're all talking about. He's the guy who created the internet. You, know, you could arguably be the, considered the godfather of the internet. And we had this very fascinating discussion of, you know, what would happen if there was an outbreak of a conflict between the US and China how would not just a company like a Google face it, but how would the overall internet deal with it? We're, you know, these are new, th tough questions. Um, but it's also the shift in the relationship between the private sector and the government. So Vint Cerf and the group there, they were government sponsored and they create ARPANET, which becomes the internet. And of course now the relationship is flipped where it's the private sector that's often leading and it's the government that is reacting to it. And I think we see the difficulty of this in the discourse over encryption, um, where much of it is just sort of the shift in the power relation between the private and the government sector and how we wrestle with that. So bottom line in all of this, these trends, these three trends, they're amazing, they're overwhelming. There are no easy answers to any of them. And that's why I think they're going to define our challenges in the year ahead. But again and again and again, they cross issues of intelligence with issues of technology. They cross issues of the private and public sector, which is why I think initiatives like this are just, you know, you know not only are so needed, but are going to be busy for the generation ahead. Thank you.